ahead and get started. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعجل فرجهم وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين واللعنة الدائم على أعدائهم أجمعين for the love of our beloved Prophet and his beloved progeny, please recite a second loud salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad wa ajjil farajahum. For the hastening and the return of our beloved 12th Imam and third final loud salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajjil farajahum. I hope everyone is doing well, inshallah, and we're grateful to, alhamdulillah, have the system back up and able to, inshallah, have the programs here uh, where we normally do uh, the programs. And salam alaikum to all of those who have said their salams in the groups, and uh, we are very glad to have you with us. So we will continue tonight with the discussion that we had started last Thursday night, and that was a discussion on this characteristic that the human being has, and that is the characteristic of greed. We talked a little bit about how the, the, this characteristic, if one understands how central it is to the creation of the human being, and how it has been there from the beginning of time with the human being, this will change the way the human being looks at his life. If I understand that I was created in such a way that no matter what they put in front of me, no matter what they bless me with, I always want more than what they have given me already, then this is a very important piece of information to have about myself. This is going to bring me a lot of self-awareness because I live in a world where everything is limited. I live in a world where money and wealth is limited. I live in a world where beauty <clears throat> is limited, I live in a world where fame and popularity is limited, and at the end of the day, the blessings that I have, they are limited blessings. And so if I understand that I was created in such a way that I will never be satisfied with anything that is limited, the way I look at the world will extremely and fundamentally change. I won't look at this world as the place where I will be able to fulfill these desires that I have. I understand that this dunya will not be able to offer everything that I need to me. And we said that this has been there from the very beginning of the creation of Adam. This concept of greed that we call it in a negative sense or just the idea of not being limited or not being satisfied with anything that is limited. Always wanting more. This concept has been tied to the human being from the very beginning. When you look at the story of Adam that we talked about last week, we said the one key or the one hook that shaitan used with Adam, that shaitan even grabbed the attention of Adam with, was this concept of wanting more. Because when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the garden told Adam that, listen, you're not supposed to eat from this tree, he also told them that, listen, while you're in this garden, your life is very easy. While you're in this garden, as the verses of the Qur'an say, as long as you are here, إِنَّكَ إِنَّ لَكَ أَلَّا تَجُوعَ فِيهَا وَلَا تَعْرَى You never go hungry. You do not need clothing. وَأَنَّكَ لَا تَضْمَعُ فِيهَا وَلَا تَضْحَى You never deal with the heat of the sun, right? You never go thirsty. A lot of the issues that you normally would have to deal with in a material world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Adam that you don't have to worry about these things. You don't have to deal with these things. And the hook that shaitan used to even grab the attention of Adam and even bring his attention to this tree was what? فَوَسْوَسَ إِلَيْهَا shaytan And shaytan came to him and started to do waswasa. قَالَ يَا Adam. He said, Adam, هَلْ أَدُلُّكَ عَلَى الشَّجَرَةِ الْخُلْدِ وَمُلْكٍ لَا يَبْلَى Yes, you are here and everything is fine. But is, do you want me to show you a path or a life that's even better than what you already have? Question. Is the life that Adam already has bad? Is it, does it have problems? Does it come with so many difficulties? No. But if Adam knows there's something better out there, Adam wants that better thing. This is how the human being is. And this is what shaitan knew about the human being. 
قال يا آدم هل أدلك على شجرة الخلد وملك لا يبلى Do you want me to introduce you to a path where now you become everlasting? Things are fine right now, yes? But do you want to make it even better? Do you want to make it, you know, better by infinity? Do you want to make it unlimited? Shajaratul Khuld. You eat from this tree, you will be everlasting. Wa mulkin la yabla. And a kingdom that will never perish. Do you want me to show you the path to something like that? And this was the angle from which Shaytan approached Adam. Now, this whole story of Adam and Shaytan, is it a literal story? Is it a symbolic story that the Quran is telling us? Was this an actual sin? Was it not? Was it simply something that Adam should have not done? It was better for him not to do. Not that it was haram for him to do. All of this topic is really a place of major dispute within the Shia school of thought and within different denominations within the Muslim faith. The one thing that within the Shia school of thought is held pretty, you know, uh, in mainstream opinion within the Shia school of thought is that what Adam did was not haram. This is the opinion that you will find is held within the Shia school of thought. This is less of a matter of a dispute. But the other issues that I mentioned, how you interpret this whole story and what was this tree and what were the fruits of these trees and where was Adam? Was he in heaven or was it in this garden? These are all very much matter of interpretation and matter of dispute between different scholars. But you see from the very beginning, this idea of wanting more all the time, not being satisfied with anything that's limited, is tied to the very existence of Adam from the very beginning. And this is why we read the hadith of Imam Hassan al-Mujtaba. He said there are three mistakes that have really defined the future of mankind, the life of mankind. Yes, the first one was arrogance that we saw in Iblis. The second one was hasad or jealousy that we saw in the two children or one of the children of Adam towards the other. And the third one was what the hadith referred to as al-hirs, greed, meaning wanting more, which we saw in Adam. Okay, so this has been there from the very beginning. And the Quran talks about this left and right. Our religion teaches us not to be greedy. And we said last week, and I'm just going over these points because we've covered these, and I want to move on to the next uh, section of the discussion. We mentioned last week that if a person does not understand that he will never be satisfied with anything that is limited, if he doesn't understand this, then in his life he is continuously going to push himself in this world to, to try to fulfill his desires. His desires for fame, his desires to fit in, his desires, his desires to feel accepted by people, to feel valued by people, and so on and so forth. His desire for wealth, beauty, whatever you want to think about. And the more he tries to fulfill these desires, because the world is limited and he wants unlimited, at the end of the day, he sits there, tired on one hand and unfulfilled on the other hand. And this is why the hadith of Ali ibn Abi Talib said, he said, Al-hirsu matiyyatu ta'ab. He said, greed is the means of fatigue. When you have greed, or when you're greedy, or you have greediness within you, what happens? At the end of the day, you sit there tired and unfulfilled because you've been working so hard and you've been trying, you're putting in so much mental energy into whatever this thing is that you want. But at the end of the day, even if you get it, there's something else and it keeps going on and on. And in another hadith, we read that beautifully Ali ibn Abi Talib says, he says, Al-Hirsu la yazidu fil rizq. Being greedy, it does not add to your sustenance. But the one thing that it does do is this. وَلَكِنْ يُذِلُّ الْقَدَرُ القدر. But what it does do is that it makes you humiliated at the end of the day. It humiliates you because it reaches a point where you want more and more and more and now you have to take away from yourself and put it into this thing that you want. Yes? If you think about someone who's addicted to something, and of course when we use this word, the first thing that comes to our mind is a substance, but even if outside of a substance, right? Imagine someone's addicted to wealth. If they're addicted to this and they never feel fulfilled by whatever they have, then they're going to be willing to work and work and work to get more and more and more. But then their point, there comes a point where now they have to put from themselves, from their relationship, from their time, from their family. And then this is where the humiliation starts to come into the picture. Because now he's willing to give away anything to get more of this thing. 
And of course, at the end of the day, he's not fulfilled by it. So all of these negative things we mentioned about greed, but the question that remains is this. At the end of the day, if this is such a terrible characteristic, if this is such a negative characteristic, to always want more, to never be satisfied with anything that is limited, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala place this inside of us? Why did he put this sense and feeling inside of me that even if I have a hundred mansions, I still want an extra one? Even if my bank account has 20 zeros, I still want more. You know, of course, 20 zeros with a number before those 20 zeros, not just the zeros. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make me such that if, for example, whatever beauty I have, I want even more of it. Whatever popularity I have, I want more of it. Likeability, I want more of it. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make me in such a way? The answer to this question is this, because if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had not placed this deep with, within the human being, the human being would never even pursue God. The human being would never even pursue heaven and the hereafter. If the human being was to be satisfied with a very little pleasure in this world, a little bit of money, uh, you know, a nice house, a nice car, for example, if he were to ever be satisfied with just this, he would never even look forward to the hereafter. He would never push himself for the hereafter. He would never sacrifice to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He needs this sense of always wanting more. He needs this sense of not being satisfied with things that are limited because the only unlimited thing out there is God. And if he doesn't have this sense inside of him, he will not pursue God. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala planted this seed deep inside of the human being, it was for a reason. It was a blessing. And that blessing is what? That that seed is supposed to grow with the proper managing and the proper nurturing. It's supposed to grow into a sense where I look upon this world and I say, you know what? None of this fulfills me. I want something bigger and greater, which manifests itself in heaven and for some people, in certain types of pleasures in heaven, and some, and some people being close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I will only ever look forward to the akhirah if I already have this sense of never being satisfied with the limited deeply embedded in me. If I don't have this deeply embedded in me, then why am I even working for anything greater? Sometimes you'll see, for example, a child, this sense of wanting more and more has not been, it hasn't developed yet, yes? You know, when people, when human beings get older, this greed inside of them, usually if they don't take care of it, it starts to grow. It's mentioned in multiple hadith that the human being gets older and his greed gets younger. And his greed does not age, meaning that the greed is still there. And in fact, it grows. Okay. But when you look at a child... A child whose horizon in life is a very short one. A child whose vision in life is a very limited one, right? He is satisfied with the smallest of pleasures at times. Yes? A child, you can make him happy with a piece of candy. Even if it's not the best of candy. That's why if a child wants one thing, that's the reason why you can essentially distract them from what they want to something else. Because they're satisfied with so little. Yes, of course, when the human being grows, that changes. But initially, the human being is such that he is satisfied with so little. If your child wants to come and sees, for example, uh, a glass dish, for example, and he wants to touch that, and then you hold something that makes some noise or some color in front of him, he's distracted by it. Why? Because he is satisfied with something that is so limited. That's the reason why you can distract him. But if, you, if this child had a sense of not being satisfied with anything that is limited, would you ever be able to distract him at that point? No, and this is why the human being has this sense deeply embedded inside of him. And in fact, the more he grows this sense inside of him, this desire inside of him, the more it will push him towards the akhirah, but with the right vision. And that vision is understanding that this world cannot fulfill his desire. That desire should be strong, but he has to understand that that desire can't be applied to this world. So it's not so much that always wanting more is bad. The question is, what is it that you want more of? That's the question. And this is why in Quran and Hadith we find 
that the Prophet ﷺ, the character that you cannot come across a character better than him, more perfect than him, more blessed and more beautiful than his, the Quran says, you know, this Prophet of yours, he is Haris. Wait a second, you said Haris is bad, you said Hirs is bad, you said greed is bad, we're not supposed to have greed. We're supposed to be okay with whatever we have. No, Islam says, yes. Wanting more is not bad. It depends what you want more of. If what you want more of is of this dunya, then yes, you're going to be in trouble because you will never be fulfilled. But the Quran also calls the Prophet Haris. Why? Because he wants more of the Akhirah. The Quran says, listen, we have sent to you a Prophet. This is the verse 128 from Surah at tawbah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the surah says this. He says, listen, we have sent to you a prophet. min anfusikum. Number one, he is from you. He's not a stranger. No, he's from you. Number one. Number two, azizun alayhi ma'anitum. It's difficult for him to see things that bring you trouble. You know how a father looks upon his children and if he sees his child is dealing with a problem, he is hurt more than the actual pain that the child is going through. It says, It's difficult for him to see when you guys go through difficulty. And then he says this, He has greed when it comes to you. Is this the negative greed? No. This means that if he sees any way that he can help you, he won't hold back. He works for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so much. He wants more when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so much that if he sees he can help even a little bit here, he won't hold back. Harisuna alaykum. He's always concerned about you. He's always thinking about you. If he thinks that I can deliver one more message to my ummah, then I can do that and I will do that. And this is why we read in some of the ahadith that the Prophet ﷺ says that prophets were given different requests by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and du'as that they would be granted and I held on to mine and mine will be held on to for the day of judgment. When my ummah comes and they need my shafa'ah, I'm going to hold on to it for that day. This is harisun alaykum. Meaning that if he sees he can help even a little bit he doesn't hold back because now he's not haris for the dunya. He's haris for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He wants more and more of what? Of coming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of doing good. This is why the Quran refers to the Prophet as haris. Harisun alaykum bil mu'minina raufur rahim. And he is kind when it comes to the believers. And then you move on through the verses of the Quran and through hadith. Then you find that this greed that normally we look at and we say, oh, that's such a terrible word, word greed, ah, that's bad. Then you look in Quran and Hadith, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects you to be greedy. But greedy for the akhirah though, not greedy for the dunya. This is why we read in Surah Mutafifin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining that on that day the, on, in heaven, right? He's describing what it looks like to be in heaven. He says, إِنَّ الْأَبْرَارَ لَفِي نَعِيمًا those who do good, they are in, in midst the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in heaven. Inna al-abrara lafi na'im. Ala al-ara'iki yandurun. They are sitting on these reclining chairs. They are leaning on their chairs. They are completely comfortable and relaxed. Yandurun. And they are looking upon one another. Ta'arifu fi wujuhihim nadratan na'im. When you look at their faces, you can see the bliss of the pleasures that they are indulging in, in their faces. That's how much they are taking pleasure in heaven. And then he continues, yusqawna min rahiqin makhtum, and there is this special drink, and the Quran doesn't tell us what this drink is. All it says is yusqawna min rahiqin makhtum, there is this drink, and this drink has a characteristic with it, makhtum, what is it? Khitamuhu misk, it has this wonderful smell to it. And then the Quran says this, When it comes to this, you all should be competing with one another. You all should be greedy when it comes to this. You shouldn't sit back and say, Oh, well, as long as I make it out of hellfire. Many of us look at religion in this way. As long as I can make sure that I don't burn in hellfire, you know, I'm good. 
That's not what Quran and Hadith wants you for. That's not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you for. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't create you and me just so I sit there and say, as long as I don't burn in hellfire. No, He created you and me for a much greater status than that. And the Quran says, listen, when I describe this heaven for you, compete. See which one of you can get ahead of the other one when it comes to this. Because the Quran wants you to want more when it comes to the right things. And if that sense was not deeply embedded inside of the human being, the human being would not even think about the akhirah. He would look at his life right now and he would be busy with this dunya. And as much as he is busy with this dunya, he's satisfied. So he has nothing to worry about. And if you tell him about heaven, and you tell him about the, ne the next world, and you tell him about coming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and all of these different pleasures, he doesn't care about them. Why? Because he is satisfied with limited things. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed this sense inside of us. It plays a very, very critical role. It is a role without which we would not even be pursuing God to begin with. And this is why the Urafa and the scholars, they say that every single human being, because they have this sense inside of them that they are also always pursuing the unlimited, because they have this sense deeply embedded within them, technically everyone is pursuing God. Sometimes, though, they just mistaken this unlimited existence with the worldly things that they find around them. They think that this car will give them that type of pleasure. They think this house will bring them that type of pleasure. They think that this position or this, uh, you know, likability or whatever it is. Otherwise, everyone is looking for the unlimited existence. And religion is here to remind us that this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. That's the role of religion. And of course, the way to reach that point is through the day-to-day -day ahkam that we have. This is why Islam is such a beautiful mix, brothers and sisters, between the abstract and the practical. The abstract is that, listen, you are never satisfied with anything that is limited. You are pursuing God. Deep down, you want God. That's who you want. That's the abstract. And then at the same time, Islam practically will show you how you can reach that point from where you are to where you need to be. I will share one more hadith. And you find this also beautifully in the Quran. So many times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says when it comes to the Prophet, that the Prophet used to put himself through so much difficulty. Why? Because he was so haris. He was greedy about the good things, about the right things. Meaning that if he could find one more person he could save, one more person he could guide, one more person he could help, he would never relax. This is why the verses of the Qur'an were revealed. And this is one instance of it. There are many other instances as well. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God himself turns to the Prophet and says, Ya Rasulullah, you need to take a break. You're pressuring yourself too much. This is what you find at the beginning of Surah Taha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Taha, ma anzalna alayka al-Qur'an li tashqa. We didn't send down this Qur'an to put you through so much trouble. What trouble is this? The trouble that the Prophet knows that this message, he wants to save as many people as he possibly can. But of course, it's not up to him. They have to accept it. They have free will. But he wants to do as much as he can. And the Qur'an says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Taha ma anzalna alayka al-Qur'an ali tashqa. We didn't send down this Qur'an to make life so difficult for you. And in other verses of the Qur'an, we read that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet, It seems as though you're about to kill yourself because these guys won't believe in you. Why? Because the Prophet was upset that they wouldn't believe in him? No, because he was trying to do everything in his power so that he could save as many people as he possibly could. This is why the beautiful hadith as we said yesterday or the last week we mentioned this, that, that the Prophet ﷺ said, and in this hadith you will see the beautiful comparison between being greedy for the wrong things and being greedy for the right things. The Prophet ﷺ said, Man humani la yashba'an. There are two people who are hungry, they will never feel full. Talibu dunya, the one who's greedy about the wrong things, he's looking for the dunya constantly, he will never feel full and satiated and fulfilled. 
وَطَالِبُ عِلْمٍ And the one who is seeking knowledge. This one, he will learn every second of his life. And he will never feel satiated. The first one is a problem. The second one is wonderful. It's not so much about greed itself. It's about what are you greedy about. You look at, for example, the work that you can do. Some people are greedy, brothers and sisters, but they're greedy about the right things. This person sees that if he can save a little bit of money here, he can save a little bit of money there. If he can reach out to this person, reach out to that person, solve the problem of this person, solve the problem of that person. Even when he can't solve their problem, he shows them good akhlaq. Even when he can't solve the problem, he does as much as he can. Even when he can't solve the problem, as some of our hadith says, he wishes he could solve the problem. This person is greedy, but for the right things. And we are to be greedy for the right things. This is how you compete for the right things. This is why in Surah Ali Imran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ Hurry! Rush! Be hungry! For what? For the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضَ and a, and a heaven that I can't even describe for you, it's greater than the heavens and the earth. We don't even know how great the heavens are. You know, today, scientists don't even know how great this universe is. There are still so many parts of the universe that we have not even observed, right? And, and in so many aspects of this world that we still don't know of. And the Quran says, listen, this heaven, this world, it's greater than this stuff. In some verses he says, in other verses, in other wording, you don't even understand how big it is. Rush towards it. Compete towards it. Be greedy about it. This is an adv uh, opportunity you have 50, 60, 70, inshallah, 120 years of your life. Take advantage of every second of it as much as you can. And this is a, a lesson for myself as well. And with that, inshallah, I will bring in, uh, this portion of the talk to an end. Inshallah, next week, we'll move on to a separate topic. This greed that we have, if it's, if it's something that has to do with this world, then we have to remind ourselves that this world is temporary. This world is going to pass by. This world, it's going to be over. Imam al-Sadiq was telling his famous companion, Abu Basir. He said, Abu Basir, Ama tahtam, ama tahzan. Does it ever happen to you that you sit back and you feel sad and you feel like you could have accomplished more in your life, accomplished in the sense that you could have had more in your life, more money, a better life. And as we read in, the, in history, Abu Basir, he did not have eyesight, yes? He couldn't see. And Imam Sadiq asked him, he says, does it make you sad sometimes that you could have had more in your life and you don't? And he says, yes. And the sixth imam tells him, whenever this sadness comes to your mind, that I wish I had more, I wish I had more money, more beauty, more wealth, whatever the case may be, he says, remind yourself of the fact that you will leave this world. Remind yourself of the fact that you will die. And when you leave this world, this temporary world will come to an end. And whether you had things or you didn't have things or how much you had, it's not going to be a worry for you anymore. It's not going to be a concern for you anymore. This is very unconventional. This is very un, uh, uncommon for us. If, I, if I'm feeling down, feeling sad about the fact that I could have a better life, I could have more blessings, more money, more houses, more cars, I'm supposed to remind myself of leaving this world? Isn't that, uh, isn't that a scary thought? Isn't that a frightening thought? Isn't that a sad thought? No, not in Islam. In Islam, the idea that you are leaving this world is a thought of liberty. It is a relieving thought, not a sad thought. It's a relieving thought, knowing that you're going from a place that could not fulfill any of your desires to a place that can. And this is why Imam Sadiq told Abba Basir, he said, remember the fact that you will go into your grave and none of this stuff will matter for you anymore. And he says, if you do this, then the hirs, that greed that you have for the things of this world, it will start to leave your heart more and more. Let us, inshallah, move on to the ahkam portion of today. Recite a salawat, please. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad wa ajjil farajahum. We were discussing the rulings of a traveler's prayer. The first thing that we mentioned is what counts as a starting point when calculating the distance of my trip. We said that according to Ayatollah Sistani, it is you start counting from wherever people consider you to be a traveler from wherever people say, you know what, this person is now making a trip. 
So for most, most of us traveling within DFW, if we're just going from one city to another city within DFW, yes? If I go from Carrollton to Irving, for example, people don't say this person went on a trip. It might just be his commute, for example. Moving on, we said if I'm not sure where I should start calculating the distance from, we said that you do not start calculating unless and until you are sure that this criteria that we just mentioned applies to you. So if you have a doubt about whether you traveled 10 miles or 14 miles because you don't know where the city ends, you will go with the smaller amount, the 10 miles, for example. That was what we covered last week. I'm going to move on to a very important point, and that is this. And this, what I'm about to explain, brothers and sisters, are rulings that I can tell you maybe 60, 70% of our communities do not have a correct understanding of. They actually have a quite a bit of a misunderstanding with regards to these rulings because they're quite detailed, but hopefully we'll try to simplify it. What needs to happen for a city to become my watan? Watan, of course, is an Arabic word referring to a place where if you are in that place, then you pray full. Even if you're in that place for less than 10 days, even if you're in that place for one day, you pray full. This is the, the definition, the fiqhi definition of a place that you call watan. You know, watan, of course, is a word. You might, I mean, we have it in Farsi. We might even have it in uh, Urdu, I believe. Okay? So what needs to happen for a place to become my watan? There are mainly three different ways that a place becomes your watan. Okay? The first is the place where you are born and you are raised there a little bit that people say, you know what? This is where he was born and raised. Like people attribute you to the city. Okay. Now, if I was just born there, you know, and I was not raised there, that's going to be a separate discussion. And it seems as though that does not become your watan. If people don't consider that to be the place where you essentially were born and lived a little bit. If they don't attribute you to that city, it's not going to count as your watan. But if they do, which is normally the case, normally wherever you're born, you stay there at least a couple of years, for example, yes? And, and then you left, this place becomes your watan. This is number one. Number two, any other place that you go and you decide that I am going to live here indefinitely. Now, we never know what happens in the future. And this is the question that I always get in this regard. People say, well, Sheikh, how do I know? I don't know what's going to happen five years from now. That's not what matters. What matters is what is your plan. If your plan is for the foreseeable future, I am going to be living here and I don't plan on moving to any other city, then that means that place becomes your watan. This is the second way that a place becomes your watan. Meaning that if you go to that city, even if you're there for a day, you pray full. You do not pray qasr. Number three, the final way that a place becomes your watan is if you live in a city where you have not made the decision to live there indefinitely, but now you have lived here long enough that, again, people attribute you to the city. They say, yeah, this, is, this is where he lives. And so for Ayatollah Sistani, he says, somewhere around a year, a year and a half, a year and a half is where this happens. Ayatollah Khamenei, for example, says a year. So essentially, if I stay somewhere for that long, it will count as my watan. And beyond that, beyond these numbers, what we know for sure is seven or eight years, for example, is definitely going to become your watan. But like I said, even earlier than that, and even shorter than that, is going to become your watan. One of these three ways needs to apply to a place in order for that place to become your watan. Two points that I need to mention here. Based on this definition, it is completely possible for someone to have multiple watans, for someone to have multiple cities where when they go to that city, they pray full. It could be, for example, a place where you were born and you lived there for a certain amount of time, let's say five or six years, yes? And then you move to another city and that other city, for example, you stayed there for another five or six years, right? So the first method and the third method, you can have multiple watans. Or even someone in, makes a decision that I will indefinitely live in between two cities, six months of the year in this city, six months of the year in this city, continuously or nine months here and three months there, for example, continuously, all of these will count as multiple watans for this individual. So it is possible to have multiple watans. 
Second point I will mention is this. When we say you have a watan, we are talking about one city. We're not talking about a, a, a state. We're not talking about a country. I can't say Iran is my watan. No, I have to see which city one of these three applies to. Then that place will become my watan. I can't say Texas, Texas is my watan. It's not how it works. It has to be one particular city. So it's not that I can take multiple cities and consider all of that to be my watan. It is only one city. Inshallah, next week, we will talk about, um, number one, what happens that a place that was your watan no longer is your watan? What needs to happen for that place to no longer be considered your hometown anymore? That's number one. And number two, the, uh, the question about people who uh, are students, they travel very often, and things of that nature, more rulings that we need to cover in this regard. We will leave that, inshallah, for the following weeks. I'm just going to check real quick uh, to see. And also, if someone owns a home or a house or a property in another city, does this become their watan or not? We'll, we will discuss that, inshallah, next week. I'm just going to check real quick to see if we have any questions. Okay, I don't see any questions here right now. So, inshallah, with that, we will bring tonight's talk to an end. Let us take a moment to recite Surah Fatiha for all of our marhumin and marhumat with a loud salawat ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salla ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad wa ajjil farajahum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen ar-Rahman ar-Rahim maliki yawm ad-deen. إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين